This is ContactTalkRadio.com. Consciousness in action. And you are taking action into your consciousness by tuning into Contact Talk Radio. And on TuneIn.com, Hing.fm, and Upsnap Mobile. Contact Talk Radio. Welcome to Carpe Diem with your host, Lisa McDonald. My mama told me when I was young, we're all on superstars. She pulled her hair with my lipstick on. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in once again. My name is Lisa McDonald, and I am your show host for Carpe Diem. Good Friday. This is truly a good Friday, and I'm very, very blessed and grateful to have such a wonderful guest on my show, which before I introduce and turn over to my guest uh, to have the floor here, I certainly need to extend uh, thank yous to Pavel Mikulowski. Um, it was through him and his reaching out to me uh, that he suggested this guest to me. Uh, we share mutual friends on Facebook, uh, primarily people associated with the radio network in which I'm talking from, CTR, Media Broadcasting. Uh, so I want to say thank you very much to Pavel for setting this up for me. This is wonderful uh, and really timely that this show and, and this particular guest is uh, with us here on Good Friday. So happy Easter to everybody. I hope it's a wonderful weekend for everyone. And so I just want to, before I turn the floor over here, uh, my guest today who's joining us is Dr. Jamie Turndorf, a.k.a. Dr. Love, who is known to millions as Dr. Love through her website, AskDrLove.com, which is the web's first and immensely popular relationship advice site since 1995. Um, as people know, I don't really like to read, but I'm reading uh, a little bit of information about Dr. Love just to get the information correct and to plug her properly before I turn it over. So her methods have been featured on all the national networks, including CNN, NBC, CBS, VH1, Fox, on websites like WebMD, iVillageDiscovery.com, MSNBC.com, and in Cosmopolitan Men's Health, Glamour, American Woman, Modern Bride, and Mary Claire, to name only a few. Dr. Love also wrote a column called We Can Work It Out for Psychology Today Online. Uh, Dr. Love's radio show, she's both an author and a radio show host. So Dr. Love's radio show can be heard in Seattle on KKNW and on Talk Zone, which broadcasts in 80 countries worldwide. Dr. Love is also author of the new Hay House book, Kiss Your Fights Goodbye. Dr. Love's 10 Simple Steps to Cooling Conflict and Rekindling, Rekindling Your Relationship, which has been endorsed by number one New York Times bestselling authors Jack Canfield, Dr. John Gray, John Bradshaw, and Harvard Professor of Psychiatry, Dr. John Mack. Uh, Dr. Love has authored a plethora of books and has written the Ford for Others. Um, testimonials uh, that I've read about Dr. Love and how her story, revelations, techniques and such has impacted people's healing processes is absolutely miraculous in itself. Jack Canfield, for one, who is author of The Chicken Soup for the Soul, Book, Empire and The Secret, had this to say about Dr. Love. Dr. Turndorf has relationships figured out. If you want a great relationship, you must read her book and follow her 10-step method for lasting love. So simply a phenomenal endorsement from uh, a fantastic man who's been extremely successful in his own right. Um, so I'd like to extend a warm welcome to my lovely guest today, Dr. Jamie Turndorf, again, otherwise known as Dr. Love. Uh, again, she's an author and a radio show host, among other things, to many people. And she's uh, author of the book, which we're primarily going to be speaking with on today's show, which is entitled Love Never Dies, How to Reconnect and Make Peace with the Deceased. So this was obviously birthed out of, birthed out of a, a very personal story, which... Dr. Love, thank you for joining us today. Oh, I'm uh, so happy to be with you. So lovely to have you here. And uh, because it's your story, originally I was going to open it up with the description of your story and talk about that. But that's intimate. That's yours. Uh, I'm going to let you speak to that for our audience. Oh, that's so sweet, Lisa. So let me just tell you how it all began. You know, it, it's an amazing story. When I was a little girl, I had a premonition of the man that I was going to marry one day. I actually saw him fleshed out. I saw his face. I saw him perfectly. So I said to myself, just wait until he appears. 
And he ended up appearing on the first day of my freshman year at Vassar College. And I had been shut out of all the introductory sociology classes, and I asked, Asked the secretary, what could I do? And she said, go ask the department chair, Jean Pin, see if he can find a seat for you in one of the closed classes. So what happened? The minute I walked into Jean's office, I had the first and only out-of-body experience in my life. I felt my soul shooting at high speed through a tunnel to the end of my life. And then I shot back into my body, and I got this message Remember every aspect of this meeting. He's going to be everything to you one day. Now, I forgot about the message. I went about my life as a freshman at Vassar, but I soon learned that Jean, for most of his life, had been one of the most famous Jesuit priests in history. He had taught at the Vatican. He founded a movement called Liberation Theology, designed to fight church oppression from within, and he actually launched to international fame when he publicly opposed the Pope and the Catholic Church as they were trying to block the legalization of divorce. And he, being a radical feminist Jesuit priest, he didn't want to see women trapped in marriages where they were being abused. So he fought on the grounds of liberation theology, religious freedom. The church should butt out of the private sector. And he won. And he got the divorce bill passed. He changed the course of Italian history. Soon afterward, the Pope granted him the dispensation of his vows, and he left the Jesuit order and the priesthood and was recruited by Vassar. Now, wow. it's amazing. So now, in my senior year, four years after that faded meeting where he got me into intro sociology, four years later, I needed help with the statistical portion of my thesis. And I had heard also... But Jean had been a statistician, having founded the Vatican's first and only social research center. So I approached him and asked him if he could help me with the statistical portion of my thesis. And even though he wasn't my advisor, he cheerfully gave me his time. Now, in a couple of weeks, we knew we were made for each other. Despite our different cultures, backgrounds, religions, we were just completely compatible. Twins separated at birth, soulmates. Now, I have to say... Lisa, that I was raised by two devout Jewish atheists. <laughs> the only religion my parents practiced was religiously hating each other. I read that. They I know. They taught me not to believe in <laughs> God or the afterlife. I never read the Bible. I never went to church or synagogue. And Jean and I never discussed religion for the 27 years that we ended up being together, where we were just inseparable. Now, in the last year of his life... We both began having premonitions separately that he was going to die of an accident. We just didn't know when or where. So we went to our final vacation in Italy, and as we were sitting on the beach, I saw his hand up over his head as if to block the rays of the sun, and the next thing I know, a bee swoops down and stings him right at the location of Christ's stigmata on his hand. And I watched my beloved suffocate to death in front of my eyes wow. so now hard. I can't dis it's so traumatized there's no way to even describe what it is to have him ripped from me this way so now I go back to the hotel room Lisa and I am lying in the bed and I'm hysterically crying and I'm shaking and I'm trembling and then next thing I know I feel that man's hand stroke the entire length of my spine now I know what I felt I sit bolt upright I look over my shoulder, and of course, nobody is there, but he was there in spirit form, and he has been with me ever since. Now, his astonishing and ongoing manifestations, often in front of witnesses to this day, have proven to me that we don't die, and therefore, our relationships aren't meant to end in death. And so I've created a groundbreaking new transdimensional grief therapy method that totally diverges from the Western approach, which is grieve, let go, and move on, which only leaves the bereaved at an even greater loss. Instead, my method shows you how to say hello, not 
goodbye without the assistance of a medium, a channeler, or a psychic. And then there's one more thing. As a shrink, I know millions of people worldwide harbor unfinished business with the dead. And again, Western grief therapy also offers us no way of making peace with the deceased. So my new Dialoguing with the Departed technique offers the first vehicle in history for enabling the bereaved to not only reconnect, but also to make peace with the deceased. Fantastic. What I'd really appreciate you touching upon, which I actually got goosebumps when I was researching uh, your story and uh, the testimonials and and how this has uh, trans. It's it's just transformed people's lives, their healing Mm -hmm. processes. Um, Could you kindly tell us a little bit about the, when you talk about the witnesses and this coming through for other people, can you tell Mm -hmm. us about the incident involving your friend Anne as well as Gabe? All right, I'm going to, let me just, I'll lead you up to that example. Because, okay. you know, Love, Love Never Dies is in three parts. So obviously part one is my memoir, where I pick up from the night that Jean left his body. So let me tell you a few examples of Jean's astonish, astonishing manifestations that I share in part one of Love Never Dies. And then I'll lead up to Anne and Gabe. I'll, I'll finish with it. How's that? Perfect. Okay. So I come back from Italy and... I, of course, hadn't slept the whole night, and I get out of bed, and I hear Jean saying to me as I enter the kitchen, Jamie, open the back door. I want to show you something. So I open the door, and what I see, Lisa, on the back step is a chipmunk, and the chipmunk is sitting there frozen as if in a trance. The chipmunk does not run away. He's just frozen in, with a glazed expression. Now, the next thing I see, that chipmunk begins mimicking my husband's bodily death. I watch the little creature ripping at his little face with his hand, ripping and ripping and ripping. The way my husband was ripping at the oxygen mask to try to get it off of his face because he was suffocating and it wasn't going in. The air wasn't going in. So, of course, tears are raining down my cheeks as I watch this little creature mimicking his bodily death. And after 20 minutes of this, I see this little creature visibly cough up a wonk of mucus and he's fine. And in that moment, I knew my husband was using this animal to convey to me the message, I'm okay. Hey, Jamie, I'm okay. And I have since coined the expression open vessels to describe animals, domestic and wild, who are able to communicate messages to us from spirit. So now the next thing that happened is I had to fax Jean's death certificate to my phone company to take his name off of the account. Now, I had sent many multi-page faxes throughout the day, no problem. But when I went to fax his death certificate, the cover letter faxed without a hitch, but then the machine froze and would not fax his death certificate. I tried again with the obituary. Again, cover letter goes through, but the obit hangs up, will not fax. So the next day, I mean, I tried this 20, 30 times. It doesn't work. I give up. The next day I go to the lawyer's office. I don't say why. I just hand the secretary the pile of papers and I say, would you mind faxing this to Verizon for me? After 20 minutes... All the secretaries come out of the back office. They're hysterically crying. They say, Jamie, we tried 20 times, multiple times. No matter how many times we tried, the cover letter faxes with a hit, without a hitch, but the death certificate and the obit will not fax. He is wow. trying to tell you he is not gone. Wow. Okay. I know. So I go home, and again, I have to fax his death certificate somewhere else, and again, it hangs up. So I stop, and I say to him out loud, I think you keep hanging up the death certificate and the obit because I keep forgetting you're still here. If I Mm -hmm. promise to try to remember, will you let this fax go through in its entirety? In that moment, I feel an enormous tidal wave of love pouring into me. And I knew it was his way of acknowledging, I heard what you said. Okay. I cancel the fax. I reissue the fax. It goes through in its entirety. Okay. So now... Now I'm starting to realize something pretty wild is happening. He is here. Mm -hmm. So now I'm walking down the street, and day after day, people who don't know me, didn't know Jean, don't know I'm widowed, they just walk up to me and say, your husband says, tell our story, and then they walk on. (laughs) So now I'm just like, my life has just completely turned upside down. Now one day I'm driving in the car, 
And I, for the first time in my life, feel the need to pray to him on behalf of someone else. Now, I never prayed in my life. So I pray to him, please help my friend Emily find love. I look at the clock in my car. It's 4.58. And in that moment, I feel a tidal wave of love, which is what made me look at the clock to note the time. Now, I have to say, Jean never knew Emily, never saw her, nor did she know Jean. She had never seen his picture. That night, Emily phones me. She says, Jamie, I have to tell you what happened. I said, well, what happened? She said, today at 4.58 exactly, I fell into a trance. Your husband appeared to me. She describes to me what he looks like. It's exactly right. She says, he told me to find love, follow the gray stones to the church in your neighborhood. Now, by having her repeat my prayer to him, he was proving to me he heard my prayer. You see? My goodness. And he was also blessing Emily by sending her to the church. Now, a week later, I go to my professional group. And there's a member of the group. Emily's a member as well. She tells the story about what happened. And then a member of the group named Mitch Wood, who was a former seminarian, says to Emily, what was the name of the church in your neighborhood? And now she says, it's called the Claremont Church. And Mitch says, oh, my gosh. The Claremont Church is New York's only liberation theology seminary. Wow. That blows your mind how he put his stamp on this entire, entire magical manifestation. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about the phone call you asked me to mention with Anne. And it's a whole, like a whole intricate, intricate tapestry here of manifestations that I'm going to share. One day I was lying in the closet and I was crying. I described this in Love Never Dies. And I was thinking, I have to call my friend Anne. And then I'm thinking, but it's the middle of her work day. No, you can't bother her, but I've got to talk to her. And I'm there on the closet floor crying, thinking this, when my phone rings after about a half hour of this. I drag myself out of the closet and I go to the phone. It's Anne. She says to me, Jamie, did you just call me? And I said, No, Anne, I was too busy crying, but I told her I was thinking I had to call you. She says, but Jamie, my phone rang, and your name and number appeared on the caller ID. (laughs) So we realized Shaw was so aware of what I needed, he called Mm -hmm. her for me, manipulating the electronics to put my name and number on the caller ID. Now, a year later, I have a very bad chest cough. I cannot breathe. And I start to think I'm going to suffocate to death the way Jean did. So out loud, I plead with Jean, could you do that caller ID phone trick again right now to prove you're here with me? Could you do this? Do it with my housekeeper, Donna, right now. Okay? The next thing I know, my phone rings. It's Donna. She says to me, Jamie, did you just call me? I said, no, Donna, but then I told her how I asked y'all to please do the caller ID (laughs) trick. So she says, Jamie, my phone rang and your name and number just appeared appeared on my caller ID. So now I go to my writer's group and I'm telling all the stories of Jean's manifestations in part one of Love Never Dies. And Gabe Davis, a devout Jewish atheist who's the head of the writer's group, says, you know, I sure would like to see that caller ID phone trick repeated. And this time, I would like to see whether your phone shows a record of having been manipulated by Jean to dial out. Okay, so Mm -hmm. now I forgot the whole challenge, forgot it. A month later, I am driving behind Gabe and his wife. We're set to go to dinner after the writer's group meeting. And all of a sudden, as I'm driving, I feel that tidal wave of love again. And I look at the clock, and it's 4.58. I get out of my car when we arrive at the restaurant, and Gabe runs up to me. He says, Jamie, you will not believe what happened. What happened, Gabe? He says, at 4.58, my cell phone rang. He said, I looked at the caller ID. Your name and number was on the display. (laughs) (laughs) He says, I picked up the phone and a man's voice said, is Jamie there? Is Jamie there? He said the voice extended the word there like it had an accent, which Jean was French and he did extend that word. It sounded like there. It extended. He said it wasn't a real call. The voice just faded off. The call never clicked off. He says, go get your phone and see if it dialed me at 4.58. So I dig into the bottom of my purse. I hadn't used the phone all 
day I pull it out, sure enough, it had dialed him at 4.58. Oh my so goodness. what is the point of all these over-the-top manifestations? It's because Jean asked me to tell our story. So these manifestations are for you and for everybody listening. Because as he told me after he left his body, Jamie, let our love shine like a torch that lights the path for others. So our story is meant to let you know that your loved ones are here with you too. They're just waiting for you to open the door of your heart to them. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Let me just ask you, uh, Jamie, now outside of when you talk about the tapestry and things having happened and occurred at 4.58, I does, know. Four, does 4.58 signify the timing in which uh, your late husband passed? No. Oh, well, then again, you know what? Now that you mention it, I did, I, you know, I hadn't figured what the hour meant. And I don't, I don't, he, he left his body in the evening, you know, like at 11. Mm -hmm. But um, he was stung. Perhaps I have to look back and think, maybe that's when he was stung. You know, I have to look because there is a reason that it keeps happening at that hour. Yeah, for, there, there has to be a reason why. For yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to look at that because I think that he, we were in, we were at the beach, and it was the afternoon. So perhaps that's what happened. And I'm going to check that out. And thank you for uh, helping me to uh, pay attention to that. Yeah. Hmm? Well, um, so. So tell me how else this has resonated for you and by you sharing yours and your love story and the fact that love never dies. What are you hearing from other people? Uh, because oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. It's just, you know, I did the Coast to Coast interview and my book, Love Never Dies, became an overnight bestseller. It sold <laughs> out on Amazon. By the next morning, it was sold out. And I'm getting calls from people and emails from all over the world. It's just changing their lives because, well, it kind of comes to part two. Part two of Love Never Dies, I talk about how you can overcome the false beliefs and the religious teachings that prevent so many people from reconnecting. And I talk about how it's even possible to communicate with those in spirit. So our story is opening the door for other people to realize that their loved ones are here too and that they are meant to reconnect as well. So could I talk a little bit about the obstacles? That I would love, I, love to. I'd love to hear yeah. this. Okay, so the first obstacle that we have to overcome is the wrong belief that we're not supposed to stay in connection with loved ones in spirit. Now, how did I know that this is even a belief that people are taught, that you shouldn't stay in connection? It happened my first night back in Italy, from, back from Italy. I was lying in the bed not sleeping, and I heard Jean speaking to me, and he was quoting something I did not recognize. Now, the next day, I went to his priest to prepare the readings for his funeral, and I mentioned that Jean has been talking to me, and he's quoting something. Now, when I said this, the priest raised his brow in obvious skepticism. He looked like he was thinking, you know, this babe has really rounded the bend. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> then, then when I told him what Jean was saying, he literally blanched. He crossed himself, and then he said, dear God, James." At first, I didn't believe that John was talking to you, but I do now. And he told me that I was quoting an obscure biblical passage from the communion of saints. Like I knew, I never read the Bible, I never went to church, and John and I didn't discuss religion. Now, it took me a year to understand why John cho chose to quote that and only that biblical passage to me. Now, remember, he was a religious pioneer in life, and he continues to be in the afterlife. The communion of saints says that our loved ones in spirit are one with or in communion with God and the saints. And since the Bible says we're supposed to stay in communion and communication with God and the saints, this means we are supposed to stay in communion and communication with our loved ones in spirit because they are one with God and the saints. So the point is, what we've been told about the afterlife is dead wrong, if you'll pardon my pun. <laughs> we are not meant to live in an emotional wasteland separated from those we love waiting until we die and enter heaven because as Jean told me heaven is a state not a place heaven is all around us heaven is here and now so this means we're supposed to reconnect with our loved ones in spirit now 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So now I also go on, and this is what everyone's responding to, because between our story and me talking about Jean's after his bodily death revelations about why we're supposed to stay in connection and, and remain connected, I talk about some of the other misconceptions that get in our way with uh, reconnecting and staying connected. This is another biggie. It prevents you from moving on with your life. You'll hear that a lot. And this is so untrue because the everybody who reaches out to me <clears throat> on Hay House Radio, I have a show there, Love Never Dies, Tuesdays at noon Eastern. People are calling me from all over the world, telling me my method has transformed their grief to joy. And that's what happens when you reconnect. You're more able to fully enter your life instead of lying on the couch grieving endlessly. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We reconnect and we transform our grief to joy. So we're more fully in our life in joy. Now, Mm -hmm. here's another huge misconception. Well, if you reconnect with a deceased spouse or life partner, you can't love anybody else. Where did we ever get that idea? Because it would be like saying to a mother, you know, you had one child, you love that child with all your heart. Well, you can't have any more children, can you? Well, Mm -hmm. our hearts are made to love. We have plenty, plenty of room to love everybody who walks the earth. And all those who walk in spirit. Now, here's another one that I hear a lot. Well, you're holding them back from performing their work in heaven. Well, I mean, how grandiose of us to assume that we could somehow interfere with some divine plan. (laughs) The thing is, everything I hear from every being in spirit, including, including Jean, is their work is to love us. That's mm-hmm. all they're, that they are in spirit to be our guides, to hold our hands, to support us as we walk down the bumpy road called life, to help us fulfill our own spiritual development and our destinies. What else is there for me to do? It's my full-time occupation to love you. That's what Jean said. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and that's what I hear again and again from my patients, loved ones in spirit. They have nothing else to do but to be here to love you and support you. Right. Now, here's another biggie. Oh, you're opening the door to evil or maybe even the devil. Well, now, I have never experienced any evil or dark forces or anything uh, because our loved ones in spirit are our gatekeepers. They're here to protect us and watch over us. And I have never experienced anything of the kind. Plus the fact we all have what I call an internal spiritual call blocking. So if there is such a thing as negative spirits, we can block calls we don't want to take, period. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, well, let me <clears throat> let me just. There's a couple things that I'd like to say with res- in response to all of this. I, um, you know, I've always been very open-minded, and I've always, for myself personally, I, I've always deemed myself to be an extremely spiritual person, and I certainly believe that there's something bigger than us. And I've always referred to it as the universe. In fact, my second book uh, is titled Reimburse the Universe. And I did, my relationship is with the universe. Um, and, you know, and I know that that can be extrapolated and carried over to all various forms or interpretations or belief systems within religious sectors, within uh, spiritual spheres. Um, and so I've had a couple of experiences myself. Uh, one more recently, and I think it was related to the fact that I was doing research on you and perhaps at the subconscious level this is what came through but my grandmother who lived in England who I was extremely close to regardless of the geographical distance um, she passed October 2013 now it seems like it was only yesterday uh, very extremely close to her and in fact Easter was uh, you know I just put up a post on Facebook the other day saying that Easter is very synonymous for me with my grandma um, she you know just just how we always dialogued how we communicated um, certainly miss her snail mail miss her holiday phone calls but anyway a couple nights ago um, for the first time since her passing, uh, she came through in a dream for me, and it was very vivid, and uh, it was brief, uh, it was beautiful, we dialogued with each other, and uh, I believe that she sensed that there was some strife going on in my life. I mean, I'm always very positive, and I always work my way through things um, and manifest a lot of greatness in my life as well, but in that particular moment, there was some struggle going on, and uh and so she, I believe she seemed to obviously have picked up on that. And she came through very strongly. And her parting words to me before I woke up in that conversation we shared was, keep going, Lisa. And so, you know, 
that having been my waking moment, that having been the last thing communicated to me, call it a dream, call it a vision, uh, I, I felt like I was awake, although I was sleeping. Um, and then later that day, which was yesterday, I was running errands and I was uh, driving and I happened to behind, be behind a vehicle at a red light. And the vehicle's license plate said her story. And to the left mm-hmm. of that, to the left of that was a British uh, flag sticker. And I took a picture of that and I uploaded that because I had only hours before made mention of the fact that Easter was very synonymous for me with memories of my grandmother and what that all entailed. And, you know, again, you know, being a writer, uh, you know, being in that state of feeling like I was struggling a little bit and feeling a little bit conflicted with some things, um, having awoken from having had that dream, her coming through, obviously thinking about it while I was driving, and then to be parked behind a vehicle that, to me, it had my grandma written all over it. And so, and, you know, and it, you know, I... <laughs> I'm very much, I've always been the type of person who I don't, I've never ever believed in coincidences. And as a result of the last couple of years of my life of having become extremely clear, things are showing up all the time. Uh, you know, things that people would normally deem to be coincidental. And I don't believe in coincidences. It's because I'm clear and, you know, what you put your attention on grows stronger in your life and the things that you truly hold dear and what you wish to hone and what you wish to, you know, envision your life as looking like, these are the things that are showing up for me. And so when I when I was researching you and when I hear you talk now, like I'm th- this whole conversation I'm just I'm getting major goosebumps and uh mm-hmm. you know so I just um you know I just want to say thank you. Uh you know because I don't know that that dream and that image and that conversation I had with my grandma would have necessarily come through if I wasn't primarily focused on the fact that you were my guest today. And, and, so, and her story. Her and story. her story. Absolutely. Tell her story. Right. Yeah. Right. And right, here right. I am talking about it. I'm talking I about must her. say that most of the guests, most of the hosts that have told me Jean has come through to them in one way or another. And when I do most of my interviews, he plays with the electronics. Uh, when I did a Skype interview a couple of days ago, the announcer said that he heard uh, a man's voice speaking after I would speak. <laughs> wow. So, so, uh, so here's the thing. I want to just demystify, you know, spirit communication because yeah. the fact is we're just talking about energy communication or energetic communication. And yeah. we all do this all the time. And we're all born with the innate ability to communicate energetically. You know, if you think about it, when uh, you park at a light and you look over at the driver in the, neighbor, in the neighboring car, doesn't that driver always look back at you? Mm-hmm. Because that driver is sensing the energetic frequency of your gaze. Similarly, we know that twins uh, know when the other is in trouble, even when they're living on opposite ends of the world. And Ener- energetic communication. And what's amazing is now... When I did research for the book, I discovered that many of the most prominent figures in history, from Socrates to Helen Keller, reported having personal contact with spirits. Even Thomas Edison said in Scientific American in 1931 uh, that it was reasonable to conclude that those who have left the earth would like to communicate with those they've left here. And he believed that we could construct an apparatus that would be sensitive enough to enable the communication and he was actually working on this in 31 right when he left his body and Albert Einstein in his introduction to Upton Sinclair's book on telepathy mental radio asked science to take this phenomenon seriously Sigmund Freud said in 1921 if I had my life to live over again I should devote myself to psychical research rather than psychoanalysis and Carl Jung the Swiss psychotherapist and the founder of analytic psychology wrote a lot about this topic. But the thing is, we have never heard about this. And it we don't hear, because they didn't teach us in our school books. We were told that it's not possible to connect, so nobody focuses on it. And here's a story that illustrates the point of just how pervasive it is that mainstream religion tells us it's not possible to connect. So I went back to Jean's priest and I told him about Jean's ongoing manifestations. And the priest said to me, you know, Jamie, once he's in heaven, you won't hear from him anymore. 
what? There are no cell towers in heaven? Or the signals from Earth aren't strong enough to reach the cell? I mean, it's ridiculous, these human right. con- misconceptions. So the whole day, it was bothering me what he said. The whole day, it's on my mind. Now the evening comes, and I make the circle in my group room for my office. I work in my house, and everybody is late for the group except my new patient, Ashley, who's coming for the first time. She doesn't know me, didn't know Jean, obviously. And the door is closed to the group room. We're alone. Next thing I hear, ding, ding, which is the sound my front door makes when the burglar alarm chimes to alert me to the front door opening. Next thing I know, I hear loud pounding footsteps that stop in the waiting room adjacent to the group room. And I say to her, gee, somebody must have come in at the wrong time, not realizing I run a group now, perhaps somebody coming for an individual session. Now I hear the loud pounding footsteps going in the opposite direction as if the person is leaving, and I hear the front door chime again. So I say to her, listen, I'm going to go talk to the person. Now, in the time it took me to get to the front door, There was no way that somebody could have walked down my very long driveway and gotten in his car and driven away because my driveway is so long and the parking area is very far from the house. I go to the front door. I open the door. There is nobody there. Nobody. No car. Nobody. So I come back to the group room and I say there was nobody there. And my patient Ashley says it was a spirit. (laughs) <laughs> so that was Jean's answer to the priest statement, once I'm in heaven, you won't hear from me anymore. Did you hear those footsteps? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely stories. Well, let me ask I, you this then, because there's a lot of people, um, like-minded people who are in my circle. And of course, you get to this age and, you know, people have passed on, parents, siblings, whatnot. And, you know, I, I have one friend in particular, uh, her name is Donna, and her mom passed away. And so the symbol that reminds her that her mom is present and with her and offering her strength is dimes. So she sees dimes everywhere. And usually at the time where she's feeling the most vulnerable, emotional, or, you know, missing her mother. And so for do, do you attribute, um, like, do you believe that there's different levels of the manifestation coming through? Um, like, do you believe that uh, perhaps you and your late husband, because of the synchronicities in which you shared, uh, because of you know how glued to the hip you were and how involved you were in each other, uh, and what you believed in and what you've manifested when he was with you, present, living on you know here in this sphere. Do you think it's it's because of the the, the depth and the width of your relationship that all of it, that? that is- Love is the currency of connection. So the more bonded you are, right, the more easy it is for you to continue that bond. That mm-hmm. said, it's very important for everybody listening to know that even if you didn't have a perfect bond, that does not matter because in part three of Love Never Dies, I show you how to establish your own connection with loved ones in spirit. You don't need a medium, a channel, or a psychic because we are all born with the innate ability to communicate. And communicating with a spirit is nothing more than learning how to tune your brain to the spirit channel. So basically in part three of Love Never Dies, I show you how to make the reconnection. And I teach you in part one, uh, the first chapter of part three, how to create a state of receptivity. Because this is very important. A lot of us just are drowned by the noise and the chatter of the day. And as Jean said to me, the noise of the day drowns me out. So anytime you want to hear me, come to the bed and be still and quiet. Mm -hmm. So in this chapter, I show you how to create pockets of peace. I show you how to sit in silence, turn off the TV and the music, how to use the right peaceful, peaceful practice for yourself. And then I show you how to use your breath because spirit is born on the breath. I also have a section in this chapter on how to surrender to your emotional states but not get too upset. Because if we're too upset, especially in the early days of grief, we actually block the sending and the receiving of energetic signals. Then I show you how to use twilight states, which is the state just before sleeping or just upon awakening, how to nudge your way into spirit communication, how to use nature to help you connect. And then the chapter ends with really fun exercises for opening your five senses. Because remember, spirit beings are pure energy, so they're able to energetically send signals to all of your senses. And the more your sensory receiver is turned on, the easier it is for you to perceive signs that are being sent your way all the time. Now, regarding signs, this is the next chapter 
in part three of Love Never Dies, how to recognize the signs. Because most people will say to me, listen, you and Jean had an intense connection, as you said, Lisa, and I didn't, I'm not getting signs like this. Now, invariably, I will lay out the signs of spirit presence, and in no time, everybody says to me, oh, that happened to me, and so did this, and so did that. So the point is, freed from the human vessel, our loved ones in spirit are able to influence the material world in infinite ways. Signs include, you know, animals behaving oddly, like the chipmunk story, odd sensations, drafts, temperature changes, chills, goose flesh, symbolic communications, butterflies, and even the manifestation of coins that were minted on a year that was significant. Now, here's my coin story. I had a patient in my office this year named Kyla, and I said to her, you know, Jean's always dropping coins on me that were minted on the anniversary year of his bodily departure. So when I said that, Kyla blinked. She says, oh, my goodness, Jamie, I nearly forgot. See the boots I'm wearing now, these cowboy boots? Well, they were off my feet in the middle of my bedroom when I saw a quarter careening from the ceiling out of nowhere and landing in my boot. And I got the message that it was for you, and I never took it out. She says, let me give it to you now. As she turns her boot upside down, I hear Jean saying to me, you'll see it was minted on the year I left my body. Sure enough, I take a look at the coin. It was. So for most people, becoming aware of the signs is sufficient to begin their own process of reconnecting. But here's where love never dies, takes spirit communication to an entirely new place. Uh, The CEO of Hay House said to me, we've never seen anything like what you're doing in Love Never Dies. Because I show you how you can dialogue back and forth with the departed. This is my new technique, dialoguing with the departed, to reconnect, to obtain guidance, and most especially to heal any unfinished business you may have. Now, we, we know that spirits dialogue with us in various ways, like through dreams, as you said, through mm-hmm. mind melding, where they induce a thought in our mind. They also communicate with us using signs, where they actually, you know, drop a sign on us like the coin. Now, Mm -hmm. but we can actually engage in a back and forth communication between us and spirit using these earthly props, which are, you know, usually electronic devices or using open vessels. Now, can I give you an example of the difference between static signs versus a back and forth communication using the earthly props? Please do, yes. Okay. So this year on the anniversary week of Jean's bodily departure, I went to my chiropractor and Teresa was at the reception desk. She was the secretary and there was nobody else in the office. We were alone. So I tell her about Love Never Dies and I say I'm going to give my first public uh, talk about the book. As soon as I say that to her, I smell gardenias. Now, I did not say a word. And Teresa says to me, Jamie, do you smell gardenias? <laughs> so I said, Teresa, that's the scent of sanctity. Jean is giving us both a sign that he's here. Okay? He mm-hmm. just dropped the sign on us. Now, mm-hmm. the next day, I saw a patient who needed to reconnect with her sister in spirit. So I told her the story about the scent of gardenias. And at that moment, I heard Jean dialoguing with me and saying, I wish I could give you a bouquet of roses. Now, he was inducing that thought in my mind, sending me that message. At that moment, the patient abruptly sat up and she said, Jamie, do you smell roses? Now, that manifestation shows how he used her as a human open vessel to facilitate a back and forth dialogue between him and me. He used her to let me know that I had heard him correctly. I wish I could give you roses by implanting the smell of roses in her mind. And of course, he bolstered her confidence and her ability to hear spirit so that she could reconnect with her sister. Now, I want to mm-hmm. give you another really, really cool example of how we can okay, dialogue and then I have, spirit. And then I have a question for you. So you go okay. ahead. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Here's another really, really cool example. One day, my friend Anne, right, was coming home to my house to take me to dinner. So Mm -hmm. I said to Jean, you know, every time she comes, it feels like you're coming home to me because she allows you to speak through her. Mm -hmm. So two seconds later, she walks in the door and she says, honey, I'm home. Okay. Now, she says, I'm really sorry I made such a rude joke. I said, no, 
You were communicating Jean's answer back to me. He heard me saying, it feels like you're coming home to me through her. And you said, Hon honey, I'm home. He used you as an open vessel. Mm -hmm. Now we're at dinner. She wouldn't cry if her kid was hit by a bus. Next thing I know, she gets this glazed expression in her face like the chipmunk. And now she starts to cry. And she says to me, you look so beautiful tonight. I wish I had a camera. Now, uh -huh. Jean used to say that to me when we were alone at a restaurant. Nobody heard that but me and him. So he was using her to dialogue with me. She was the open vessel used in the service of love. Mm -hmm. So you said you had a question. Yeah, beautiful. I'm loving everything that you're sharing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so my question, and perhaps this is something that's been asked of you before. So for the person who's still here alive, let's say that the person is more evolved and self-aware and more receptive than the individual who passed over. And let's say the individual who's still here is very receptive to wanting to dialogue, to want to communicate, to be able to interpret signs and is very open to it. If the person who passed over was blocked, was negative, uh, was unresolved, was conflicted, and let's say that you know hindered the relationship between the two parties, for the person who's still here, who's receptive and would like to uh, perhaps you know experience some of what you're sharing, probably not on the same degree because of how solid and how in tune you and your husband were. Um, how do you answer those questions, or how do, how does that become okay. possible? Okay, so here what we're talking about is part three of Love Never Dies and how to use my dialoguing with the departed technique to resolve unfinished business, okay? Now, mm -hmm. it does. It, the point being, as one of my patients said, I wish my mother would hurry up and die so we could finally work this out because in spirit form, they are more evolved. So whatever unfinished business you had, you now have an opportunity to resolve it. So what I show you how to do is I show you how to dialogue to heal this unfinished business. Now, you may still harbor resentment toward that being in spirit. That being in spirit may have something unfinished with you. Whatever it is, I show you how to enter a trance. Then we do my meditation for making contact. And then we dialogue back and forth in writing or using a tape recorder. I fully explain all this in Love Never Dies. And here's the most beautiful thing. Often we have to wait until they've lived their bodies to work it out because in spirit form they are more evolved they see how they screwed up now I discovered this the week after Jean left his body when I went to the garage to have my car repaired Jean did the car thing they didn't know me I go up to Debbie at the desk and I say to her listen um, Jean left his body so I'm here to do the car she says to me I'm a widow too with that her husband in spirit form pounds down my door, and this is what he says. Tell her to stop making the same mistake that I did with our son because now she's creating the same power struggle. Now, mm -hmm. this blew my mind, right? I tell her this, and she says, oh, my gosh, it's true. But the important part of this experience was he realized the mistakes he made only w and once he entered spirit. So now that was remarkable but then what I discovered soon after that was that beings beings in spirit need our help to help them evolve spiritually so if we are more evolved if we have unfinished business none of it matters we not only do we need to heal and we are poised to heal things with them now that they're in spirit because they are hungry to not only help us work it out but they need to work it out to evolve spiritually now how do I know this I went to see a woman I call the bird lady. Her name was Lori. She had tried to help us save our little canary unsuccessfully. So it's, oh my goodness, Good Friday. It was this day. Oh, wow. <laughs> and Jean let, he led me to the lady. Now I walk in the door and as soon as I walk in, she points out a Gouldian finch in a cage that's looking very bad, all plumped up and not moving. And she says that bird hasn't eaten in two days. And when they're this little, if they don't eat, they die. So I said to her, can I try to help your bird? She says, okay. I go over to the cage, press my cheek against the bars. Normally that would have freaked a bird. This did not freak the bird. Now I speak out loud. I am energetically communicating with the bird, but I'm speaking out loud so that she will hear what I say. I tell her, bird, go down to the seed bowl, and I want you to start eating your seeds right now. The bird obeys, 
goes down, starts scarfing up seeds like a little mini vacuum, vacuum, and the more the bird eats, the healthier it gets. And it's chirping and jumping around. And now I realize there are two spirit presences in the room. First, I hear her mother. Now, I don't know this woman. I don't know who's in spirit, who's in not, but not in spirit. Her mother says, I'm so sorry I didn't protect you from him. I am so sorry. And then I see the bird. Well, the woman, Lori, says that's true. And the mother says, I was a weakling. And and Lori says, my mom always said I was a weakling. So now I see the bird looking sick again. And I realize that the presence of this woman's father is around the bird and making the bird sick. So I say, don't worry about this. Go back to eating. I'm going to help her. The father comes through and he says, I know you're scared to death of me, but I can't hurt you anymore. I can't rape you anymore. I need you to face me and confront me about how I violated you. I want you to be in peace and to heal, and I need to be confronted over what I did for my own progression. So she admits, yes, he did rape her. We dialogue, and she goes on to heal her fear because she was perpetually stuck in the wounded, abused child place, and she was helping him grow. So this is what the dialoguing with the Department of Technique will do for you. No matter where you start out, you will be able to heal unfinished business, pick up where you left off, improve your relationship. But this is the thing, Lisa, I'm so excited about this piece. And this is the neatest part of all. We all know our purpose on earth is to perfect our ability to love ourselves and others. But we can't love ourselves if we, we can't love others if we don't love ourselves, right? Very now, true. I'm living, I am so living proof of the challenge. How do you love yourself when you were raised in a crazy family? Because I tell in Love Never Dies, I was beaten physically and verbally, and I struggled with my parents' mean voices putting me down in my head. And in spite of all my husband's love for me, it didn't quiet those voices. Mm -hmm. Now, after he left his body, I was in my professional group, and I was saying, I just can't get these voices that are tearing me down to go away. So everybody in the group, all the professional shrinks said, yell louder, shut them down. With our... It didn't work. I come home and Jean appears to me as the embodiment of love. He takes my face in his hands, turns my face toward him in the light, and he says, listen, listen, listen to me. Allow my love to enter you. And Lisa, in that moment, I realized freed from the vessel of his human body, his spirit and his love for me could now enter me unimpeded and his love for me instantly became my love for myself. And so this is the way we can fast track our self-love by connecting with our loved ones in spirit. Their love for you now becomes an overwhelming flow of love for yourself that you are now free to share with the world all that love is feeling over there it is very profound very powerful and very beautiful and and dr turndorf i i want to excuse me thank you very much for for joining us and for sharing we're just about to wrap up here and this is obviously a topic that i'm very interested in as are millions of people obviously clearly uh based on the success and the outpour of people being intrigued by you and seeking out your messages uh and and really uh, you know gravitating towards your message so yeah I want to and may I that. tell everybody also that they can get a free excerpt of the book just come to askdrlove.com sign up for my free newsletter and you'll get my preface and intro to get you started a lot of people do that while they're waiting for the book to arrive Wonderful. And um, and I would love to hear back from you with regards to the significance of 458, because I'd like to yes. think with all, with all that we're talking about and, and how often with whom you're talking about, uh, you know, your, the presence and the spirit of your husband having come through, maybe that's what came through here is the 458. Maybe I needed to ask you that. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, there you go. There you go. We'll check it out. Okay, yeah, please get back to me on that because I'm very intrigued. And uh, I just want to say thank you again. I know that for <clears throat> those who have tuned in here, you probably uh, have healed a lot of people. You've answered a lot of questions. You've you've turned what's normally a very sad time into a very inspiring and healing time. So I want to say thank you again. I want to wish you uh, a happy Easter weekend. And uh, for my guests, I, I, I thank you very much for joining in. This is Lisa McDonald, Carpe Diem. Look forward to seeing you next Friday. 
Friday, I can be reached at lisamcdonaldauthor.com. McDonald is M-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. For any ideas uh, or show topics that you would like for me to speak of or if you'd like to appear as a guest on my show, again, please feel free to reach me at lisamcdonaldauthor.com. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you once again as well as with you, uh, Dr. Love, and wishing everybody a wonderful, safe Thank weekend. Thank you. Take Happy care all my best. Happy Easter. You've been listening to Carpe Diem with your host, Lisa McDonald. For more information, please go to Lisa's website at lisamcdonaldauthor.com. 